Matt DeBoer, Associate Director. Um, welcome to our third lecture of the 2013 season. Um, you can use this if you All right. So Joan Serrano, FAIA, um, is an award-winning architect specializing in, in cultural and religious architecture at HGA Inc. in Minneapolis. With colleague John Cook, FA, FAIA, she has created a small design studio within the large firm's structure. The studio approach serves as an incubator for innovative design in which her projects are aesthetically driven and technically challenging. Among her highly regarded work is Lakewood Garden Mausoleum in Minneapolis, which has won 22 national and international design award, awards and was featured on the cover of Architect Magazine in October of 2012. Also noteworthy are the Bigelow Chapel for the United Theolo Theological Seminar in the Twin Cities in New Brighton, Minnesota, which won an AIA Honor Award for Architecture, the Benai Israel Synagogue in Rochester, Minnesota, the Laird Norton addition to the, I'm going to mess all these up, Winona County History Museum in Winona, Minnesota, and the Museum of the North at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Serrano has spoken frequently about architecture and design at national symposiums, including most recently the Museum of, and Architecture, Issues for the 21st Century at the Getty Center. Const uh, constructing the in ineffable uh, con contemporary sacred architecture at Yale University and innovative uses of wood to evoke a sense of spirituality at religious facilities at MIT. Um, she has been published in the New York Times the Wall Street Journal, Architectural Record, Architect and AIA Architect, where she is featured as an emerging, emerging professional in November of 2011. Serrano has a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Notre Dame and is a member of the Design Excellence Program, National Peer, and the AIA College of Fellows. She has been, been a design principal with HGA since 1993. Please help me welcome John Serrano. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, instead of running through 20 projects, devoting five minutes per project, I thought I'd concentrate on the mausoleum project. Um, and whenever I talk about the mausoleum, it's kind of weird, but I actually start by defining what a mausoleum is. When we got the RFQ, I, you know, I wasn't quite sure. I don't think I'd ever been into a mausoleum. Um, so quite simply, it's a building that houses crypts and columbarium niches. So crypts are for full body burial caskets, and columbarium niches are for cremated remains in urns. Now you might ask, why would anybody want to be buried in a mausoleum? There's a lot of reasons, but a very practical one is that in a cold weather climate like Minneapolis or Omaha, um, it's just a lot more comfortable for families to visit loved ones um, inside the comfort of a building versus trudging through 10 feet of snow to find a grave site. When we um, pursued this project, we had no mausoleum experience whatsoever. As Matt mentioned, my husband and I have a small design studio at HGA, and we focus primarily on museums. Um, and a couple religious projects. And we did have this first project, the Bigelow Chapel at the United Theological Seminary. This was a small chapel for 200 students um, in New Brighton, Minnesota. And this was really our first um, attempt to design spiritual space, which I absolutely loved. And we, in this project, we focused on two ideas, light and connection to landscape. So we developed this curvilinear translucent wood screen that basically filters west light and casts a warm glow inside the chapel. Now, this was a classic interview process where they went for a national search, ended up shortlisting three architects. I spent so much time researching this project. I knew this project was going to be a spectacular project, and I told John, if this is the last project I do in my life, I'm getting this project. So. I did a lot of research on cemetery architecture, funerary architecture and symbolism, a lot of uh, history of Lakewood itself. And of course, this project 
has always inspired me from the time I was in architecture school. This is uh, Asplund's Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm, Sweden. And this project is a sublime example of the true integration between architecture and landscape. We also studied ancient burial mounds, and a lot of this study, um, what they revealed was that the, the important role that landscape plays in the development of funerary architecture. So Lakewood Cemetery is, um, <clears throat> it's a cemetery sandwiched between two city lakes, Lake Calhoun and Lake Harriet. It's kind of in an area that is a nexus of both uh, commercial and residential activity in Minneapolis. Um, and it's a really, really beautiful place. It's technically called a lawn plan cemetery, and a lawn plan cemetery is defined by sweeping lawns, open canopy of trees, vertical markers, and winding roads. Lakewood is to about 250 acres, and it was established in 1871, but like a lot of historic cemeteries in this country, they're running out of space. They're hemmed in on all four sides with no opportunity to grow, and there's only 25 acres left um, to the right of that red circle. And then where the red circle is, that building is an existing mausoleum, and that's almost full to capacity. By the way, is there, does anyone have a laser pointer? Do we have a laser pointer here? No, okay. Um, so the, the, what we did was we chose a, kind of an underutilized site, uh, basically within that red circle, and it's a bowl-shaped site so that uh, one axis you see is the low point and then it slopes up to the north or to the south. So this is a picture of the site and this is on the north hill. And the um, grade difference between that lower level and the upper level is about 17 feet. And we chose the north side for south facing, the opportunity for south facing, um, oh great, thank you. Oh yeah, oh this is perfect, thank you. Um, so th what we called the garden level is here, and this is the street level. Sounds like a bomb. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, so it, it's a two-level site, again, 17-foot grade difference. You can see the mature landscape, and in the background there is Lakewood Chapel. Lakewood Chapel was designed or completed in 1910 designed by Harry Wilde Jones, which was a local Minneapolis architect, and the interiors were done by Charles Lamb, a New York architect. And this is on the National Register of Historic Places. Now, when we did a pre-design study, um, that, that was a pre-design model we did, the expectation on the client's part was that we were gonna string this building out across the site, kind of in an east-west direction, on both levels. But we quickly realized that with this incredible landscape, that by building on top at that street level, you not only destroy a lot of the beautiful landscape, you also cut the view to the chapel. So one of the first moves we made architecturally was we buried three quarters of the program into the hillside. Now, this was a radical idea to suggest to the client at the first design meeting because most people choose to be buried in mausoleums for the specific reason they don't want to be buried into the ground. But we pursued this idea explaining that it, it was in order to preserve the landscape above it. So below, which you can see here, there's a green roof on top, and then what you're left with um, at the street level is a small entry pavilion nestled into a grove of trees. So on the other side, at the garden level, it's essentially, um, <clears throat> you have an alternating rhythm of projecting crypt rooms, which are here, and columbarium rooms that stretch out along the east. Now you never uh, combine crypts and columbarium together because some religions are very against cremation. So you always have to keep them in separate rooms. So there's all this alternating rhythm of crypt columbarium rooms that stretch out along the east. And then the west, which is here, that's a small committal chapel. So above this is the green roof. 
And we also um, divided this mass into discrete parts to reduce the scale of the project. We wanted to develop a really strong sense of intimacy between the visitor and this building, so no wall at this level is higher than 17 feet. Now, it took us a while to develop this language. When we started, you know, so much of contemporary architecture is about glass. It's about a sense of transparency and lightness. And so we conceived of these pods as this kind of crystalline glass um, forms with these cantilever terraces, which were the green roofs. We kind of started to manipulate the canopy edge, and at this point, we were really unhappy. It didn't look like a mausoleum. It looked like a museum or one of our other projects. And it wasn't until the breakthrough really came where we dropped the whole idea of the sense of lightness and thought of these things as very solid, heavy blocks with deep recesses. And then we started to mani manipulate the recess itself to study uh, the shadowing across the facade. And you realize, with depending on how you shape that recess, you can have these really beautiful shadows. And historically, a lot of architects have used um, shadowing in terms of funerary architecture as a metaphor for death. And then once you cut into these blocks, the idea that um, maybe the material changes to reflect uh, what's beyond. And then we started looking at the recesses as separate things so that there wasn't too much uniformity or symmetry about this. <clears throat> now just one quick note about process. We work really fast in schematic design. We commit to some overarching ideas quickly. We don't stay in that big sky moment long. This is a rendering three weeks after schematic design. And the reason why we do that is because then we spend, in this case, over a year basically detailing and thinking about these larger ideas. Mausoleums are buildings that last forever. This building will never be torn down. So obviously long-lasting materials were really critical. The client thought for sure we would use granite, and I resisted granite for many, many months, tried to find another kind of stone we could use because I wasn't a big fan of granite. Granite is a fairly flat, uniform um, stone, but ultimately we found Actually, this is two different kinds of granite, one from California and one from Minnesota mixed together. That's really quite beautiful. Each piece is very long and horizontal and different uh, sizes with a split face texture. Um, and we wanted the, the long horizontal pieces so it looked like it was very much rooted to the ground plane and the split face creates a very tactile quality to the facade. The other um, predominant exterior cladding material are these white mosaics. As I mentioned, um, Charles Lamb, the New York architect, designed uh, the interiors of the chapel. And these are extraordinary. If you've, you ever visit uh, Minneapolis, I encourage you, even if you don't want to see the mausoleum, go to see the chapel. The chapel, if anybody's ever been to Ravenna, Italy, and seen those mosaics, these mosaics rival anything you will see in Ravenna. There are over 10 million little pieces of stone and glass to this. Almost every square inch of this uh, interior is mosaic tile. So we essentially continued the tradition of mosaics at Lakewood with these exterior white mosaics. This is a combination of white Carrera marble and white glass tile from Mexico. We developed a pattern that took inspiration from both natural and geometric form and developed an abstract pattern that is more dense at your eye level and then less dense as you move up. And the mosaics basically line these deep recesses and they mark important pieces of the building, like on the left, the crypt room, on the right, the committal chapel, and above at the street level, the entry. The other interesting thing about um, a mausoleum is it's a very efficient use of space. Now these buildings are very expensive, um, but again, they conserve land. This building, the footprint is on less than a half of an acre, and when this is full, it will hold over 10,000 people. 
Now, if you buried people in a traditional grave in a casket for 10,000, it would take seven acres. Half acre versus seven. So for a historic cemetery like Lakewood that's running out of space, this is really the only way to secure their long-term future. The parti at the ground level is very simple. It's essentially a double-loaded corridor, which you see here. And all the crypt and columbarium rooms are basically coming off of that double-loaded corridor. The rooms to the north, which are here, are illuminated by skylights. The rooms to the south are illuminated by large windows that look out to this new garden. The committal chapel is here. And then we design these series of exterior garden crypts, which are here, and exterior columbarium niches in these meditation gardens. So the committal chapel is, it seats 45 people. And this is a very private, very solemn room because this is where most families say goodbye to their loved ones in a 10 to 15 minute committal ceremony. So to ensure privacy, we angled the window jams such that when people are out in the garden, they can't directly see people sitting in this room, but you still maintain, you still have access to the natural daylight. This was the one space that we actually didn't have to use stone, and I totally embraced it. Um, it's just a simple oak floor with plaster walls and ceilings. We thought a lot about both the physical and emotional characteristics of materials. So if you think of stone, stone is, is beautiful um, aesthetically, but it's also a material that's very cold and very hard. And in a room like this that wants to be very soft and nurturing, we wanted to use materials that were a lot more, uh, that had a lot more warmth to them. So at the garden level, that corridor that links all the burial rooms together, it's quite long. It's over 180 feet long. And so we broke up its length by this alternating rhythm of light and shadow. You also notice all these surfaces look very uncluttered with, for all you architects, with all the crap that we have to deal with, thermostats, diffusers, exit signs. I'm proud to say that we have not photoshopped one of these photos. Now, we got a little bit of a break in terms of the code. Because in the code, you will not find a mausoleum as a building type. And this area in particular, under the code, basically the category is storage. So <laughs> we didn't have to do things like sprinklers. So we got a little bit of a break, too, there. So as, I, I, as we told the client when we suggested we were going to bury all these rooms into the hillside, we said the success of the project was going to depend on how much light we could get into these rooms. I mean, if these rooms felt like they were in a basement, we were going to fail on a major, major stage. So to the north, these, we have these series of skylights that within each room, they're in a different location. So as you move down the corridor, each room has a very different light level from room to room. There's a lot of variety. The skylights bring in a huge amount of daylight. In fact, the rooms to the north, if you took a light meter, are actually brighter than the rooms that have the large windows facing south, which we actually weren't expecting at all. So this is a crypt room. and one crypt is here, so that would be where a casket would go into, and then you would inscribe the name and the date on the marble. You see in the background there's two uh, niches. By the way, I say, when I say niche, probably a lot of architects are saying, oh, she's mispronouncing niche. Well, in the interview, I spent the whole interview saying niche this, niche that. And at the end, when we were saying goodbye, they said, you know, we call it niche. It's like, oh, sorry. So it's niche, not niche. But this is a niche. And um, these two niches here, these are called family rooms. So families can purchase one of these for their own private use. And then you can also see on this, the photo on the right um, how this skylight manifests itself on the green roof. It's basically an earthen mound that marks this sacred space. So at the garden level, um, 
It's a, it's a concrete frame, including the crypt cells that you see here. One thing about crypts, crypts are a lot fussier than a columbarium niche. For one, they take up 27 times more space than a columbarium niche. Each one of these cells has a drain and a vent pipe. And I'll leave it for your imagination what that's for. And then you also have to seal you have to have a very good seal between the crypt and inside the room. Otherwise, you have a horrible infestation of flies. So crypts are just, there, there's so much that goes into actually executing a crypt. Columbarium niche, literally a box you put the urn in. The predominant material on the inside is uh, white Alabama marble which optimizes the light reflectivity inside these subterranean rooms. They also go really nicely with the Venetian plaster ceiling. Interesting thing about this white marble, so this, this is quarried in Alabama. It was actually considerably cheaper to ship the blocks to Italy to be fabricated than it was to fabricate in Tennessee. So all the stone work was actually done in Italy. Now this white marble was the one problem on the project and it actually delayed the project by four months. Um, in the specifications, we very clearly marked white Alabama white er, marble, soft muted gray veining. So we, we, we were covered. But all the blocks that they shipped to Italy every time they started slabbing had these really strong black lines. You can see here which again, we were looking for more like that. So after many trips to Italy, and a lot of back and forth, um, we finally kind of resolved, we, we found a standard that we liked, but they had figured about 15 blocks and they used 35. So there's a lot of Alabama white marble floating around the world trying to be sold with dark black veining. The other thing about if, you, if anybody ever goes stone shopping, you have to carry around a watering can because in order to, to look at blocks, you basically water them so that you can see the veining. So in the mausoleum world, variety is key. So every room has a different color of onyx flooring and the ceiling is different from room to room. Now, if you think about it, this is, this is wise. I mean, a project like this, even though it's a, it's a religious, spiritual kind of project, it's really about retail. So if the whole mausoleum was pink onyx, and somebody came in and said, pink is my least favorite color, you've basically lost a sale. So you have to put in a lot of variety into these rooms to give people options. One note about process. Um, we do a lot of physical models. We haven't lost that. We, uh, right from the get-go, do 3D computer modeling. We, we only use Rhino, and we do that throughout the whole, but every major design decision is made through physical models. These models are not pretty, they're really quite crude, but we've found that it's the best way to study light, proportion, and scale. So burial trends in America are such that uh, cremation has overtaken uh, casket burial now. And so when we program this, we have 4,800 uh, columbarium niches and only 750 crypts, which is good because actually the crypts, they have sold very few crypts. It's mostly columbarium niches. Most people are getting cremated, at least in the Minneapolis area. So a niche is right, so one of these squares, not really square, but one of these is, is a columbarium niche. Typically it can fit two urns, so a couple could buy this or a single person. The most expensive area is what's called the eye and heart level, and that's really just the area that you can touch. So as you move further up, it gets a lot less expensive. So when you look up at the skylight, you can see there's a very um, minimal edge around that, and that was very deliberate. The skylight frame and all the structure is concealed. So when you look up, it basically, if the skylights are clean, it looks like there's very little between you and the sky above. In the South Crypt rooms, these rooms kind of very pristinely frame this new four-acre garden. 
And like the skylights, we recess the window frame so it looks like the wall is framing the view as opposed to a window frame. We also very obsessively studied finishes and very, we're very deliberate about where we put the split face, the honed, and the polished surfaces. So in this room here, the only polished surface is the floor that reflects the light and the garden. Mausoleums, although this building will never be torn down, um, they do go through a cycle. So they're expecting this building to probably be utilized in about, it, it will be full in about 50 years. <laughs> So then about 100 years after that, visitation starts to dramatically go down. So we actually designed this so that this area with all the burial rooms can be decoupled from the building systems. So the mechanical systems can either be turned off or down 150 years from now so that you're not consuming energy kind of needlessly. Because again, you've got to think about this building 500 years from now. So the north uh, crypt and columbarium rooms, although the focus is no up towards the sky, you can also see that each room has this really strong connection to the garden. The interesting thing about this pink onyx, um, they were a very trusting, very respectful client. We absolutely adored them. But when we presented the materials, they actually rejected this pink onyx. The building committee was comprised of a lot of elderly men and they couldn't imagine being buried in a pink room. So they said, look for another material. Well, in the meantime, we talked to the sales staff and they said, oh, the pink would be wildly popular because 80% of all buyers are women. Women typically uh, live longer than men. So at the next design meeting, we, we showed them some other colors, but we pleaded with them to let us use the pink and they relented. And the pink rooms are outselling the green and the honey rooms probably by double. So these are the most popular rooms by far. So part of this project was this four acre landscape and we worked really closely with a Boston landscape firm, Halverson Design Partners in Boston. And the center, the heart of this landscape is this large central lawn at the garden level with this rectangular pool that basically reinforces the axes between the chapel and the existing mausoleum. This space on Memorial Day can hold upwards of 3,500 people. We designed a pool um, that is a zero edge pool. If anybody's been to Millennium Park, it's like that, where there's basically, this is granite pavers and an inch of water floats above those pavers. And the reason why we did this, because in a cold weather climate, in late fall when they turn the pool off, it just looks like an extension of the pavers as opposed to a drained pool that gets dirty with leaves and um, looks kind of messy. Um, the nice thing about this project is we could plant very large caliper trees. These trees were seven to eight inch caliper when we put them in. Extraordinary nursery. If anybody's got a fairly good budget and you want to source incredible trees. There's a nursery in Illinois called Caneville that has these really beautiful trees. Now, the problem, I mean, it's instant landscape. Again, when these went in, it looked like a fairly mature landscape. The problem with planting large caliper trees, as most of you probably know, they basically, these trees stop growing two to four years. So these trees have not grown very much at all. They're healthy, they just, they don't grow. At the University of Minnesota Arboretum, they actually did a study where they planted a two inch caliper, four inch, six inch, eight inch caliper. Came back 20 years later, the two inch caliper tree, much healthier and much bigger. So there is a price to be paid a little bit to have this instant landscape, but it was really important to Lakewood because landscape is such a, it's, it's the essence of this place that this landscape look substantial. So one of the core ideas I talked about was to develop this really intimate relationship between the building, the landscape, and the visitor. So at the street level, again, the landscape really dominates. And it's just this small entry pavilion with this recess that gently draws people in. And we really um, studied a lot this idea of very thick walls and very deep recesses, not only to per you know, to evoke this feeling of permanence and solidity, but also um, 
uh, to uh, study the shadowing across the facades. So at the street level, the main room is a reception center, which is here. And the reception center is basically used for lunches and coffees after memorial services at the chapel. We developed a second entry here for the caterers so they're not mixing with people coming in to see their loved ones. And then to the east, you see the green roof with the skylights that bring light into the burial chambers. So throughout the centuries, if you ever go into a mausoleum, I think one of the things you would notice is that most mausoleums were built in a way that made them very dark and introverted. So again, this wasn't rocket science. We just did the exact opposite. We flooded this building with natural light. Unlike art museums, which we do a lot of, light is a good thing in a mausoleum. And not only the light, it also, there's a lot of large windows that extend out into the landscape and, and make connections with important monuments and the chapel. You know, it's interesting to, again, design a building where you know the, the primary material will be stone. And as I said, love stone, but it's a cold, hard surface. So where we could, we wove wood, in this case mahogany, through the uh, various rooms to basically warm um, some of the rooms up. You can see the small clear story window here. And this brings light down into the stairway that gets you down into the burial rooms. And sectionally, these clear stories work in a very uh, deliberate way. So as you're going down, again, into these burial chambers, you don't see where the light's coming from. The light is indirect, which historically is, is a more mysterious, a more spiritual kind of light. And then when you're coming up and reconnecting back with your life, you can actually see out that window and see the sky and the trees. The reception room is a flexible space, so again, it's used for receptions, um, but also lounge, uh, a lounge for visitors. And in, in designing a building like this, you have to think of the demographic. The average age of the visitor here is probably about 65 years old. So in rooms like this, where you could have 150 people, and a lot of people hard of hearing, the idea of sound absorbing materials become really important. So we've got carpet, we've got more mohair drapes, we've got acoustical plaster, if anybody's ever used this. We've always tried to use this on projects, never been able to afford it before this. It's basically troweled on and it has the same kind of acoustical rating as, as acoustical ceiling tile. And it looks like plaster. It's an awesome, awesome material, really expensive. But so this room, again, a lot of sound absorbing material, but down in the Krypton niche rooms, we actually wanted, um, we wanted the sound to reverberate. We wanted people to actually hear their footfall. So the hard surfaces actually worked in our favor. There's never going to be large groups down there, and so there's not gonna be a lot of noise, but the idea of walking and hearing you yourself walk um, was really important to us. The west side of the building on the um, street level is really what we call the service side. So this is where the caterers come in, and that recess is defined by this corbelled uh, stone header. And then the stair you see, that basically gets you down into that lower garden. So the green roof is basically an extension of the lawn plane. Now, as I mentioned, Lakewood is a lawn plant cemetery. So the character defining feature in this cemetery is the lawn. So when we thought about what the character of this green roof wanted to be, it made sense to just extend the lawn plane so it almost looked seamless. And then you see these skylight mounds, all the doors, windows, and skylights, we chose bronze. And we chose bronze because it's a material that patinas over time, it actually marks time. If you think of aluminum or stainless steel, it pretty much stays constant. And when you're dealing with commemorative architecture, the whole idea of time becomes really important. So the idea that the bronze will change color, it will patina, it will weather, seemed to make a lot of sense for us. When we first started these skylight mounds, we first looked at them as more architectural pieces that came up in stone or glass, but we, we realized that was far too intrusive on the landscape. You know, in many ways, we tried to design a non-building. 
I've told many people, in a project like this, you had to take your ego out of it a little bit and let the landscape really be the focus. So these earthen mounds, again, just the extension of the lawn plain with one cut edge of bronze um, seem to fit well into the landscape. One thing about construction, the construction process, so John and I, our studio is small. We don't take on a lot of volume of work. I actually work on pretty much one project at a time. So our studio is small and we focus on these projects uh, really closely, especially John and I. I mean, again, we're, we're senior, not senior citizens, but we're senior you know, architects still kind of on the boards practicing architecture. And so during construction, John actually gets quite involved in the construction process. Um, he can build anything. So a lot of times on our projects, he's actually doing some parts of the design that might be challenging to a subcontractor. Example of this is the skylight, which you can see these creases here. So they're kind of these trapezoidal, you know, we modeled this, we had the landscape sub, we had several meetings telling, explaining them these, these exact designs. The final grading, they were just kind of pushing dirt around with a rake. Well, John knew that the only way to final grade was to use long, a long screed. So in a very polite way, he said, get out of my way. And he basically final graded all three of those skylight mounts, took about three hours each. Um, so, you know, we're on site maybe four times a week. We actually live very close to this project, so we were out there uh, every weekend. So, it, you know, it, it really does become a labor of love for us. And this was the one project, usually as an architect after three or four years working on a project, you're, you're ready to move on. But this project, it's been a little hard for me to move on with, with having an experience like that. So I'm going to end um, this presentation with a video that we commissioned, just a four minute video about the project. And just one final note about the design. When we got the RFP for this project, the, the client was very enlightened. They actually said this could be traditional or it could be contemporary. It's up to the architect to decide, depending on what architect they chose. And we went into the interview very strongly, I mean, we don't do traditional architecture, saying that this was going to be a contemporary statement. And in cemeteries in America, Europe and Asia has a tradition of contemporary funerary architecture. We don't have that here. Most of it's kind of postmodern, traditional-based architecture. <coughs> so this client was pretty enlightened with even being open to the idea of contemporary architecture. But as a designer, I felt a huge amount of responsibility to design a building that was contemporary, but also not only preserved the historic character of this place, but also strength, strengthened it. So it did determine kind of the language of the architecture just by this very beautiful historic context. So I'm going to put on the video.
Okay. So if any, anybody has any questions? Well, that's the difficult thing about architecture is um, that we're always dealing with the, the scale. When we're in design, we're not dealing with things in real scale. Everything is half scale or quarter scale. Or, um, and no, we really can't go back. Um, unless you've got a client that has kind of an unlimited budget, if you start seeing things happening on the site that you don't like, you generally can't go back and say, I want to change it, because they will charge you extraordinary sums of money to change it. But remember, our process, I mean, t with today's technology, I mean, historically, architects have done two-dimensional renderings and done physical models. Physical models are actually very good tools to replicate what you're actually going to see in reality. And now with 3D computer modeling, I mean, there are renderings now that you can't tell that they're not real. So you can pretty much, um, there are very few surprises, at least in our work, um, during construction, you, you, especially on a project like this where literally every square inch of this project was designed and scrutinized and detailed, there really, to be quite honest, there really weren't any surprises. I mean, sometimes, you know, the material, especially with natural material like stone and wood, you know, it, it, like the white stone, that veining problem really turned into be a huge issue. Luckily, the contractor kind of stood, um, basically the stone subcontractor was starting to make rumblings that they were gonna default. And the general contractors, you know, stood up and basically got additional blocks and so that they could kept, keep slabbing the, the material. But generally speaking, again, with the tools that we use, you, you can pretty much anticipate most of it. And you really, hard to make changes in, the, in construction because they're just going to cost a lot of money. Yep. You said at the beginning that you took three weeks to get to the basic idea. Um, it, it, it sounds like exciting to have that happen, but then London clients come back and they, you know, this process you kind of go through, you may get to that initial idea in three weeks. Was there any kind of back and forth a little bit there where they didn't like some of those first ideas? or? No, it was like the perfect client. I mean, Bigelow Chapel was the same way. I thought Bigelow Chapel, we would never have an experience like that. Very trusting client that pretty much, um, you know, sometimes, Sometimes clients challenge you to actually make projects better. But both Bigelow and Lakewood, they were, they were clients that just had a deep amount of respect and trust. That It's like when we suggested burying all these rooms down into this hillside. They were taken aback because they really thought they were going to be strung out on the street level so people going on the road could point and say, Grandma's buried here. We basically were suggesting we're, we're doing a non-building. You can't hardly see anything. And again, they were nervous, but when we talked about the ideas, they said, oh, yeah, we, we can get on board with that. So, I mean, we've had other clients do what you're talking about, where you're constantly, but this, this project and, and Bigelow, no. no. No big challenges, except for the pink onyx. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you the only architecture firm in Minneapolis that was shortlisted? Yes, we were. Yep. How did you pull that off? As I said, I spent five to six weeks pursuing this project, doing nothing but pursuing this project. 
I no other architect could compete with that. <clears throat> I mean, most architects, as you know, are managing four or five projects at a time. They're not going to read, I read probably a dozen books on cemetery design. Again, we had no experience. And the client actually didn't want, interestingly enough, they actually, per, they looked at architecture firms that had no mausoleum experience. They wanted no mausoleum experience because the architects that generally do mausoleums do it in a very postmodern style. They're not, they're not strong architecture firms. So they were looking for no experience. But because we had no experience, I didn't know anything about cemeteries, the evolution of cemetery design, uh, funerary symbolism. I didn't know much about Lakewood. So I just did a really deep dive and did a whole lot of research. And it was. In order to be interested in a person who did not have funerary experience, how do you find a group that says from the get go? Well, again, they were very clear. They didn't, I mean, this was a very enlightened client. They knew, looking at the architecture firms that do mausoleums, that the work is not strong. Again, if you, if you do a Google search for contemporary mausoleums or crematoriums or in America, you will not find a good example that wasn't built from the, you know, earlier than 1920s. So they looked at that and obviously they had some understanding of design that the people doing this stuff, they're not doing good architecture. They wanted to find architects that were creative. And clearly Bigelow Chapel, you know, that project, um, they loved that project. So I think they felt comfortable making that leap. Um, Perkins and Will was the other another shortlisted firm, so Ralph Johnson came to the interview and, but, you know, um, it was very clear in the interview that I had spent all that time totally immersing myself in cemeteries and mausoleums. And it, I, again, I, I was bound and determined to get this project because I knew the budget was going to be good. I knew Lakewood because we lived there. It's a really special place. By the way, if anybody ever visits Minneapolis, this building is open every day. Holidays, anything from 10 to 4.30. Cemetery is open every single day. So this is a public building. And it's remarkable. Um, the dean of the School of Architecture in Minnesota, when, you know, of course, people come into town, they're like, what hot new buildings should we go see? You know, he's saying, go to Lakewood Cemetery, and they're like, oh, man. But, you know, it's, it's uh, the client is quite pleased because they've got all these people traipsing around the cemetery now looking at this building. So they've had a lot of traffic. Yep. I'm curious when you say you spent so much time researching, how much time did you have in the interview to I guess that hour. You know, it was just an hour. It was a classic hour interview. Um, but, you know, the way we do our interviews, if anybody's, uh, HA is a large firm, 650. Anybody, you know, there's a couple large firms in Omaha, I know. I know. And a lot of interviews, you take the cast of thousands. You got the engineers, you got the project manager, you got the principal, you know, you got 10 people in the room. It was just John and I. And so for that hour, you know, and usually in interviews, you know, I had probably 45 minutes of that, and I just talked about. They were very uh, interested in, your pro in our project approach. How would we approach this project? And, you know, frankly, the landscape architect was on the selection committee. And of course, they were totally wired because they were trying to protect the landscape. Well, we already realized, I knew from day one that we were going to, make this building, the, the, the landscape was going to be the focus. And we talked about that. Of course, the landscape architect, that's like, you know, that, but I wasn't being, um, you know, I was being truthful because I, I the, again, if anybody visits Lakewood, this place is really, really beautiful. And it's beautiful because of the landscape, although the things like the chapel are really beautiful too. So we just didn't want to muck that up. Have for selecting like contractors and subcontractors, either pull out the detail. Yeah, yeah, that's key. 
basically the contractor that built Bigelow Chapel built this, and it was the same team. We, we haven't, uh, John and I haven't bid a project in probably 20 years. We do all negotiated bid, so we get the contractor on board. We got, and this is Mortensen, if anybody's familiar with Mortensen, they're doing the Viking Stadium, Twin Stadium, uh, the uh, Disney Concert Hall. This is a uh, highly qualified contractor, and so we knew they could build it. We basically shortlisted only two we pre-qualified two contractors and interviewed two of them. So they brought their old team and we knew them and we loved them. And so, you know, they, as I said, when, when the shit hit the fan on the stone, they stepped up. So you're right, it's all dependent on the detailing. And one thing, even people that don't, aren't in architecture and design, you know, lay people go into that building and they notice the detailing. They're like, it just, it's very tight. And, you know, a lot of that is John. Um, again, because he builds things, he understands materials and means and methods. And so a lot of times his role for me in design is say no. Like, I'll have an idea, and he can immediately look at it, project it to construction, and say, no, you will not like what that looks like. So he keeps me as the designer on track so we never pursue something we can't build. And as everyone that works in 3D computer modeling know, um, renderings can look really awesome. But again, John knows whether or not that can be pulled off. And so a lot of times, again, when I come up with an idea I'm really excited about and just think, oh my gosh, the best idea, sliced bread, he'll come in and say, no. Yeah. You can't do it. You can't build it, won't look good, won't look what, you, what I know you think it's going to look like. So he plays a very valuable role to me. So we're never too far out into the realm where the real thing won't look good. So our buildings do tend to be highly refined in terms of detailing. You know, we, we've worked with a lot of star architects like Frank Gehry and Jacques Herzog. When they come into town, John's the executive architect for these architects because, again, of his technical abilities. And, you know, if you travel the country or the world, you realize a lot of these star architects, the buildings as they're drawn on paper and the renderings are really beautiful, but then when you see them in real life, the details don't quite hold up. So one of the things we pride ourselves with is the details actually do hold up. But a lot of it is John and then getting a qualified contractor. Any other? Questions? Why did you want to uh, walk and hear yourself walk in that space? What was the thinking there? Well, think about being in a space like that um, alone and walking to see your mother or your father visiting. That idea of just having a reference point to yourself through sound seem like a powerful thing. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a connection between you and your parent or your loved one. And the footfall kind of puts you, it makes you have that connection with them. It almost physically manifests itself. Yeah, I, I don't know if you know, people travel and they go to Europe like in a cathedral and you can hear your footfall. There's just something really powerful about that. It puts you in the context of this moment. So we thought a lot about, a project like this is all about the senses. So you don't even, you don't just think about it visually, you think about it how it makes you feel. It's so like when I said the committal chapel, I didn't want any stone. I wanted only materials that, that emanated warmth because that's a room where you need warmth. And so we thought a lot about things like that, sound, feel, touch. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We worked really closely with them. Yep. 
we worked really closely with them. Um, you know, it was a bit of a forced marriage because they were hired before us, so we did not partner with them. And they are, they are a landscape firm that's a little traditional. They don't do a lot of contemporary landscapes. So we had a little bit of an issue early on where they're, once we established the party, they were actually taking the romantic qualities of the landscape, the winding roads, and, the, and putting that down in that lower garden. And so we, uh, we usually don't do this, but we actually, I, I got our landscape architect involved to actually kind of do a party, and we sat down with them, and, and you know, they, they embraced it. And in fact, they just this weekend picked up the National ASLA Best of Competition Award. So they won the top national uh, landscape award. So I think, you know, it was, it was hard initially for them because, again, they had a different idea completely. But you couldn't deny the rational aspect of that site. And then they embraced it. And we worked really well together with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.